Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. For today's episode, Joe and I have a conversation with Joe Buick. Joe Buick is a yoga teacher based on the surf coast just outside of Melbourne. Joe's teaching style is mindful, trauma informed, and weaves a focus on self care through a graceful, gentle flow. Joe is also the co-founder of State of Being, a community-based yoga and mindfulness not-for-profit organization. In her work with State of Being, Joe partners with community organizations to innovate trauma-informed and inclusive yoga programs for client and staff groups. Now, in this episode, we'll be talking about Joe's work with trauma-informed yoga. So why is trauma-informed yoga important? Well, research suggests that exposure to adverse, potentially traumatic events in childhood is not uncommon. For example, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study in the US showed that of 17,337 respondents, 64% had experienced at least one adverse experience and approximately 12% had experienced four or more in the first 18 years of life. Further to this, a recent report suggested that childhood trauma affects an estimated 5 million Australian adults, that's one in four. In a yoga class of 30 people, at least seven of these individuals may have experienced childhood trauma. Now, with this in mind, how would you not want to approach your teaching with the utmost in care and sensitivity? I've talked for long enough, so let's get into this fantastic conversation with Joe. We should start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your background and perhaps where you grew up. I grew up in Lang Warren, which is in the outer suburbs of Frankston. So deep, deep suburbs. <laughs> deep herbs. <laughs> deep herbs, <laughs> very deep herbs. Both of my parents are Scottish, so first generation Australian and had a kind of Scottish Australian youth, I would say, because they were both very homesick a lot of the time. So grew up in soccer clubs and pubs <laughs> um, and not a great deal of interaction with anything that I do now, but yeah. And so how did you discover yoga? Um, I went to an alternative secondary school that had a bit of a Steiner influence in the curriculum. And as part of that, there was yoga on offer as an activity. So I did yoga a few times through that. But as most teenagers experience yoga, I think I found it to be pretty boring and slow, which is interesting now that I work with teenagers, having that reflection and <laughs> recognizing that in my own experience. And now that your website is called Slow Rich, yeah, I know so exactly. Yeah, I've come a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think I probably rediscovered it in my probably. I would have been about 19, so it'd be about 15 years ago now. And it was really in response to anxiety that I was experiencing at the time. And it was recommended by mental health professionals that you go to yoga. Yeah, and I experienced a mixed bag of yoga within that and sort of found my way to the slower rituals over the years. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if you had any key teachers. Mm, good question. Yeah, I find that to be so interesting in the Australian context too, mm. because I mean, I've lived in geographically isolating places. I lived in the Northern Territory. Now I live on the surf coast and I feel like sometimes you're without access to teachers. And so I would read a lot. I would read a lot of books um, and sort of gain, I guess, teaching from my books. And then in terms of physical interactions, I would say Dominique from AYA has been one of my major teachers and Mel there as well. And then moving into this period of my life, both Mark Feely and Chris Wilson are strong influences in my practice and teaching but another thing I'm interested in too I guess is the power of peer learning and I learned so much through my fellow teachers and people who are beginning their yoga journeys or people who I'm mentoring or teachers who have just been teaching a couple of years more than me I think there's so much we can learn just in healthy discussion absolutely yeah. and just different people's perspectives yeah absolutely yeah. and being able to have provocative questions and have provocative discussions about the yoga practice I find to be really really important for me it's almost like a different level of discussion when it's people who you work with yeah. rather than someone you're doing a training with like different questions come up yeah. and often it just seems to be a more open discussion right. when it's not like a teacher dynamic yeah. <laughs> and that's so healthy and I feel like I know I mean I know everyone has 
such different experiences of this. And I know I have a few friends who have gurus and very close relationships with that and important relationships with that dynamic. And I think maybe for me, that dynamic has never sat as comfortably. And so it's good when we can recognize differences and that there isn't just one model towards having a yogic lifestyle that requires that, that sort of guru dynamic and that rather that could be an option. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think there's even that approach to learning new information as well. Mm. Like, I guess the tradition is when your guru tells you something, you just take it on board without question because it's from your guru and that is that lineage way of learning. Whereas Mm. if it's kind of that group discussion of like, I don't know, what do you think about this? Like this happened in my class. How would you have handled it? Like it's, it resonates a lot more with me Yeah, as well. And I wonder if it's a female thing. I wouldn't want to make a gendered assumption, but um, in some ways, because there are lots of strong male teachers throughout the yogic lineage. And I think there have been a lot of strong male teachers that have risen because of that, because traditionally it was quite a male orientated trajectory with yoga. And now we have this vast diversity of genders involved and a whole range of different perspectives and knowledge. And so I feel like maybe it's opened up the possibilities for who a guru is and what that means for different people. And I think if I had to think about it in that way, I'd be like, I have so many gurus. Like they're so different to what I would have imagined in yoga, but there's so many people that have that quality. Mm, And Mm. like your students as well. Like you can learn from everyone. Mm. So much so. Yeah. Yeah. Your parents and your family and, You know, the people you keep close and the people you don't. Like, mm-hmm. you learn from it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From the mistakes you make. Yeah, oh, my God, so many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that does really lead us into your current teaching style, which is a trauma-informed practice. Mm-hmm. Would you like to kind of give us a bit of insight about that and maybe describe what that is for people who haven't encountered it before? Mm, yeah. So a trauma-informed practice is really supported by the principles of general trauma-informed practice. And so this is an approach that doesn't just feed through yoga, but seems to feed through a lot of different teaching and social work and nursing and the medical field and the mental health field. Now it's, it's really becoming a kind of best practice model, I would say, in those worlds. And what makes it different is that there's an acknowledgement that whilst everyone has experiences of trauma, when trauma is repeated and sustained, it can have a chemical impact. So it can have both a biological and mental and a physiological effect for people who've experienced that. And that experience will really shift the way that some people respond to relational dynamics, respond to power dynamics and respond to language. So when we're teaching in a trauma informed way, we're really looking at how can the space be safer and it will never be entirely safe. So we acknowledge that too, but how can it be safer in terms of the language that we use, the way that we move, the power dynamic that we set up and then perhaps try to problematize. So yeah, I would say those are some of the key dimensions. And so just in a practical Mm. sense, like say it was a yoga class, Mm. what are the things that would be different Mm. in a trauma-informed class? I think the most noticeable difference for me when I've attended them, but also the feedback that I've received from students is the invitational language. I think some of the other dynamics are maybe a little more subtle, but the invitational language seems really obvious because we live in a world that's very directional and if you know both of you practicing a lot of yoga you experience that too that it's very directional a lot of the time and so we often move in response to our teachers directions and often perhaps try to do everything exactly as they're saying in a trauma-informed setting that's removed entirely and there's there's really no directive at all it's all invitational so everything's a choice Um, which can also be really challenging if you haven't had to think about choice making before So I think that's the major shift. And I imagine as well, it would be a challenge between making it invitational, making sure that no one feels like they're forced into doing anything, but giving enough guidance that the class still kind of works and people still understand the movement that you're taking them through and just not having to use so many words that people have actually lost track of what you're saying yeah. by the time you get to the end of the sentence. Yeah, definitely. It's um in the training that I just finished, which was the trauma-centered, trauma-sensitive yoga certificate, which is a one-year training. We had to do video response um, each week, so we'd film ourselves teaching. And every time you sort of film yourself 
trying to use less words to get the point across in an invitational way, it sort of refined that practice too, because I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's rife for confusion yeah. using too many words. <laughs> and it goes from just lift your arms up yeah, to, yeah. to maybe if you would possibly like to, like it can kind of, yeah, yeah but it's, yeah, I think that the, maybe the powerful part is dosage. And for people who are interested, maybe in incorporating a little bit of it into their practice, just peppering it with a couple of invitational words every now and again. and Like setting a culture of you do what feels right for you. Yeah. And that narrative, exactly that, I think can be really important too, that sort of sits outside of the invitational language, but it is about the choice making and about the personalization. So that sort of stuff can be really useful. Because a trauma-informed approach, you've done a lot of training and I know that you teach specific trauma-informed classes, Mm. but it's also something that can inform a general class, just making everyone feel comfortable I know when we did the workshop with you Mm. we went through all of the lists of possible traumas that people might have experienced Mm. even something like heartbreak which you know I think we've all experienced at some stage and how we often just have no idea of what's going on in people's lives Mm. when they show up on the mat and just what we can do through our language through the environment so that people just have the best experience possible in our class like I know that a lot of people and like you said yourself come to yoga for a mental health reason and sometimes like unfortunately even if it's not the teacher's intention ever like leave the class feeling worse Mm. what are some of the phrases that you might have said yourself I know I've probably said some of them over the years that you've just completely taken out of your teaching now that you've done the training that you have yeah yeah there's so many yeah. it's quite traumatizing at first for you to think about what you've said in previous classes when you start to and all to the think best of intentions like, oh, the best of intentions and I think yoga teachers often we're really empathetic people and people's our students traumas are often unseen like we can't tell and run is such a great example of that with physiological trauma what you've survived is not visible because of the strength in your body now so we can't but we can't always assume that people yeah are in the same place so I feel like for me some of the language that um that I've had to let go of is letting go language in classes (laughs) and that has been illuminated through a, a lot of different research but also feedback from participants too that some things can't be let go of Um, And particularly if trauma has been done to you and if that trauma was repeated, there may be no way to let go of that safely. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people come to class and it's not their expectation that they'll have to delve deep into their emotional trauma when they've just come to move their bodies and breathe. And maybe have an hour where they don't have to think about all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I wonder as well whether as teachers, because so many of us have had this kind of spiritual journey where there has been emotional upheaval as part of that, where you question things that that you're interested in or question things that have happened in your life and we become very self-reflexive as teachers that we then start to share that process with our students but perhaps using our own frame of experience as a kind of guiding theme for that and so things that might feel safe for me I might then teach but not thinking that that may not be safe for someone else and so I guess as well as thinking about which themes are in or out from a trauma perspective, I've really started thinking about like what is necessary in a yoga class, what's safe. And from that point on, can I just let people have their own experiences and trust that they can do that without me having to be provocative all the time, emotionally provocative in my teaching. So I think it's a bit of a shift for me personally around that and a lot of different themes have gone (laughs) yeah down the drain with that as well I mean I had this experience of this we got some really bad medical news Mm. in Ran's illness and so we're just like okay let's just go to yoga and the theme of that class was all about breathing in bliss and it was just such like we were crying because we just wanted to go to yoga and just you know breathe and be present yes And like, that was a really transformative experience for me in my teaching, because until that had happened, I was like, breathe in bliss. What's wrong with that? That's lovely. But like when it's so at odds with your mental state at the time, Mm. it's just a nightmare. Yeah, definitely. And I've had that experience too, not to that extent, but also recognizing that something has triggered me in class. And then that 
initial feeling of unsafety, being like, oh, I'm going to get emotional. And this isn't the space where I entirely feel comfortable doing that, even though we're, all three of us would be so familiar with yoga studios and probably feel a lot more comfortable than many people. So then, Yeah, so if we as teachers don't mm-hmm. feel comfortable, what's it like for yeah, the punter who's like? new to yoga? Yeah. yeah. And it is a challenge, I think, when made because some of my favorite yoga experiences have been provocative like I've been provoked by a teaching or by a difficult asana or something so I think there's still a space for that and there has to continue to be space for that but more and more I'm thinking like how can that be optional Mm. and the space be neutral but those options provided within a neutral space rather than those options maybe being something that you're then judged upon or you feel a judgment around. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Mm -hmm. because yoga is so much more than the physical postures and we don't want to strip out all of what makes it amazing yeah but we also don't want to force all those deeper like mm. words like crack open oh, in yeah. class yeah facial expressions yeah. Around that word. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a big one isn't it yeah and i wonder where that all came from because part of me thinks maybe it was that there are all of these brilliant texts that have then been translated and we're all reading these texts and looking into things like Tantra and yogic texts and and the huge stories of the Vedas and trying to communicate some of these key teachings in an hour and 15 minutes. Mm. And so you pick the language perhaps that will get it across fastest, Mm. but you can't really fast track your way to learn those things. And yeah, so I wonder sometimes where it came from and then how we can shift it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I've been, when I talk about kind of the more elaborate themes and I guess more trying to direct someone's experience Mm. and what I've kind of gone to instead is just mindfulness. Yes. Like just tuning into what's happening at this moment. And for me, that feels like it's still some layers of richness beyond the physical practice, but it's more just about allowing people space to be Mm. in their own experience I agree 100 percent I feel like that for me when I when I think about a safer teaching experience and safer way of holding space it's it's got to be neutral in terms of tone of voice and neutral in terms of expectations so that we're not saying a more advanced variation would be this or for more advanced students you could do this or if you have capability do this or if you're looking to challenge yourself do this like making assumptions about what a challenge means for different people in the room because it could be challenging just to have walked in the door. Mm. Or it could be challenging to choose a gentle option when your go-to is the stronger one. Absolutely, yeah, the reverse. And we have so many assumptions about that. And then I think that as exactly as you said, Joe, that mindfulness language is still so yogic. Like it really is the essence of yoga to be Mm. present. And that is one of the major things I think I've learned from the practice. And if we could communicate that, I feel like that is, that's sort of the teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, without dressing it up with themes and cracking open and bullies. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, provocative language. Or I did one a while ago that was all about love and I'd just gone through a disastrous breakup oh. <laughs> years ago. And I spent the whole class trying not to cry. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. you, know. you mentioned before, I think at that time if we'd gone to a class on gratitude, for example, that might have been quite... Yeah, we weren't feeling grateful that day no. and I didn't appreciate mm. <laughs> someone yeah. telling me to feel grateful when something terrible is happening. Mm. Like, And that's, I think, energetically you can sense that sometimes in a class too, especially when you get used to holding space and, and you have people coming in regularly that you can get an energetic pushback around some themes and a gratitude is one of those, I think, that not everyone feels like they're in the place to do it and it's one of the big themes from TCTSY from the trauma center, trauma sensitive model is non-coercion and how subtle that can be, Mm. that coercive practices aren't just when we use directive language, but they're also when we make assumptions that the theme we've chosen is right for everyone Mm. and that our language presents it as the best option. And thinking about that really starts to tease apart the art of teaching, I think, too, and facilitating that that neutralness becomes so important. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But have you thought about ways, sorry, for yeah. asking you a question in no, go for it. Have you thought about ways where you could integrate something like gratitude in a non-coercive way? I think because I had some bad experiences with it yeah. as a student, I've been let, like, I choose another word. I think I'm more about being present. Yeah. Unless trying to dress it up. Yeah. And it's sort of trying to figure out what's appropriate in the yoga space. How much does it have to contain? Mm. Because 
sometimes I think we have to do it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, you know, just squeeze everything in. But maybe maybe it doesn't have to have grat- maybe it doesn't have to have a theme like gratitude. Maybe mm. that's somewhere else. But I don't know. I think as well, sometimes as a teacher, just knowing that you are enough. Yeah. Like people are already coming to your class. <laughs> like you don't have to keep adding on layers. Like people aren't getting bored. No. Like you can have space. Yeah. Which is a challenge to do as well because the pattern I guess for me (laughs) is to fill the space with words Mm, yeah that's a big one that when I mentor new teachers is there because that feeling of not being enough and having to fill the space with more to make it a worthy use of someone's time and have really creative sequencing and have quotes interspersed throughout and a a playlist that's really inspiring and (laughs) all these different things without recognizing that most people aren't coming for that Mm. and they probably won't even notice most of that Mm. but they'll come for what you offer and I think consistency in that is maybe the most important thing. Cause mm. I and also, know. I think confidence and comfort in what you're delivering. Yeah. Like if you're kind of saying something that you aren't 100% on or it just hasn't quite integrated within you, mm. like if you're a little bit confused, it's, it's going to confuse yeah. everyone. <laughs> and they're going to sense your discomfort. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So could you give us some insight into how you structure one of your classes and how that might have evolved mm. over time? Oh, it's changed so much because I was definitely one of those those people that was trying to make it a whiz bang experience for a while there which was really I think born of my own early insecurities with teaching but now very similar to what you said Joe, it's really just a mindfulness practice and I always start now at the beginning of class with a little bit of a spiel and this is just regular classes not so much trauma informed classes but I'm um, just saying that we all have different bodies and we all come to practice for different reasons and you might see different movements around you and that's all really welcomed in this space. Um, and I also recognize that people have injuries, so I'll make that a point too, that people might be taking different variations. So there's always a few minutes at the start just a discussion around that and that, I guess, that invitational language that will be used too. And then we generally move into a mindfulness practice and I'll use a bit of trauma-informed mindfulness language around that, which is usually starting a sentence with you may like to notice or pay attention to or take your awareness to different parts of your body or around the room. Then moving into some mindful movement and always spinal movements because there's so much around spinal health and mental health and the relationship between the two. So I always Ooh, include you go that. Into that a little yeah. bit more. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is so interesting. So um, there's some great articles too that I can send you afterwards. But there have been studies that have indicated that the more you move your spine, the better you feel mentally. Oh. Yeah. And I think in a really tiny way, we can get a sense of that because you know if you ever have a sore back or a sore neck, and it really does affect not only your physical body but your sense of mental health too. And the more health that you have in your vertebrae, the connective joints, the tissues the healthier your mental health will be. And one of the important nerves that connects for that is the vagus nerve, which is your longest cranial nerve, the 12th that reaches all the way down into the gut and sends off a whole range of motions of back and forth between body and brain about how you should respond to different situations. One of them being your social sense of safety. And so when we're moving our spines in class, we're not only starting to regulate our internal systems through the movement of the central nervous system in that area but also starting to regulate things like social safety and comfort which is so cool that's amazing yeah 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 and the other one that i read around that this is a bit of a detour too but is that mirror neurons which are the neurons that enable us to activate empathy so they're the neurons that fire off like if i watch someone say running really fast and i'm trying to learn how to be a fast runner i'll watch and watch the way they move and then i'll be able to emulate that in some respect which is why watching things can be really useful for learning but those same neurons that fire off the mirror neurons during that also fire off when we're in engagement with each other so we learn through patterning and through response and through watching those neurons activate more after movement so if you watch something and then you do it or you're listening to something whilst you're moving you're more likely to harness that empathetic quality through mirror neurons we so get a sense of that group energy in a yoga class yeah i guess that feeling of just like being calm and being in a community after the class that's amazing isn't it and i think things like loving kindness language around that tibetan sort of language of mindfulness and if you've got a compassionate practice and you're thinking compassionately whilst you're moving your body and whilst you're breathing there are all of these neurological impacts that are happening so the practice isn't just strength and flexibility but it's a neurological practice 
So we're sort of fine tuning our capacity to be self empathetic and empathetic to others. That actually brings me back to the question you asked us earlier about oh, yes. gratitude. Yes. Yeah. I feel really comfortable expressing gratitude for how amazing our bodies are yeah. and all of the amazing movements that they can do and all of the systems working together. Yeah. And I feel like even if there's an area that's a bit sore or something that's feeling really a bit stiff or tight, that kind of just gratitude for the intricate amazingness of our own bodies is something we can really kind of bring into our practice. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And there are two, um, there's one TCTSY teacher who uses the language around gratitude. He will sometimes say, you might like to move towards gratitude. Oh, nice. Uh, so yeah. it's, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's invitation. This can be a work in progress. Yeah. It's yeah. nice, isn't it? Yeah. And I find that whenever I hear him say, and I'm like, oh, that feels so possible because mm. it's not having to arrive there. Mm. And then the other one is the American teacher, Tara Judell. She talks about the cellular impact of your practice and having gratitude for this amazing cellular being. And the language she uses is to feel all 37 trillion cells in your body vibrating or humming with your practice, which doesn't mean that you have to be flexible or strong to have 37 trillion cells. Like you just have them regardless. You've got these little guys working them. for yeah, you. They're there and they're doing so much. Yeah. And I love both of those two framings of that. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to steal those. Yeah, yeah. go for it. I did too. Share. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yogic stealing. Yeah. So back yeah. to your class. Oh, yes, Warm up your spine. Warm up the spine. Um, then we generally move into quite slow hatha these days very invitational so I usually offer two options for most shapes and let people know they're not the only options so if an example might be knees on or off the ground for chaturanga but then someone else might choose to do a double chaturanga so they might make it more intense if they'd like to and I think part of trauma and from practice to in general teaching in this way is maybe not stripping out the capacity for strength and resilience because you can still be a trauma-informed practitioner and do really intense practices if that feels right for you. I think that should be a possibility. So, And like a very healing possibility. Yeah. Like if you want to feel strong and powerful and yeah. kind of tap into that, yoga is a really amazing yeah. space to do that, especially if there's not as many opportunities in what's going on in the rest of your life. Yeah. So you can be a warrior. I know. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I agree. I think that sometimes the misperception of these trauma-informed practices or mindfulness practices is that they're gentle and slow all the time. And whilst that may be how I choose to teach, there are great practitioners who teach in a trauma-informed way, but strong, dynamic, fast. So, you know, it just has to suit the person. Yeah, but I normally teach in a fairly slow way, but with strong options for people who'd like to take them. And then towards the end, we always finish with a mindfulness practice too. And usually I repeat the same language. And one of the most important things that I've learned through the TCTSY is the power of repeated language. So one of the things I'm exploring at the moment is repeating a sentence in different ways. So I might say, you might notice the texture of your mat under your hands. So maybe noticing the texture of your mat under your hands. And the feedback in a general class has been that for some people, the second time they hear it, the first time they didn't, Mm. they were elsewhere. Mm. And it's the repetition that gets them in their body. So I'm just exploring that. It might change. It's a nice narrative as well, Mm. kind of to start and end with a similar practice Mm. because often that's when you feel the shift within yourself. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes in respect of what we were saying earlier about weaving in themes, I used to talk to themes quite a bit and really enjoy that. And I felt a bit... Um, sort of sad when I stripped that out but I think that was my own selfish reasons because I just liked having a chat <laughs> in the end of class, the Dharma talk but, um, but these days I've been weaving in some stories so I might read say a fable from, there are some great great fables that come through the Chinese tradition and also through the Indian tradition obviously but you can find them through most indigenous traditions and I have a few books of fables and often I'll read a fable out at the end and just leave it open for meditation because I think that that can be a powerful way to maybe open up the space for someone to think about something like gratitude but without being forced into thinking about it so I'm exploring that too yeah beautiful Mm. and I must say like I haven't been to your classes lately Mm. unfortunately (laughs) but I always felt like it was a very rich very beautiful very multi-layered practice (laughs) so even though you might feel like you've stripped some things out Mm. there is more than enough there to enjoy which speaks to what you were saying earlier isn't it about recognizing that it's enough do you think that's something that comes with time though that you have to really integrate something before you can start stripping things away or do you think 
yeah. someone who's new to teaching can just sort of come straight in and say the bare minimum. <laughs> That's such a good point because it's, yeah, I don't know. Mm. It's like mm. that. There's, I can't remember who it was. It was a very famous ballet dancer who said that the best contemporary dancers are the ones who've learnt ballet first and learn all the rules and then you get to forget them, take them away. That that gives you the most freedom. So you learn it all, then you choose what you want to let go of. And I think maybe what you're saying is similar that you want to learn everything first mm -hmm. and then choose what you communicate and what you don't. Mm -hmm. But I reckon most early teachers, even if they're new to teaching, they've done a lot of self-learning and self-development. So maybe they could. Yeah. I think you definitely become more skillful with language over time mm. because you just get a better sense of what works mm. and what just confuses people. Yeah. 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 yeah, when everyone's turned in the other direction, you're like, oh, shit, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely not the 30 people in the room. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Something that I've noticed as well that pulls me out of my experience in practice is when a teacher is self-deprecating in class. And sometimes it works. Like sometimes it can be humorous and kind of humanizing. But I think when, say, you've had that experience and, like, 30 people are turned the wrong way, you can, like, laugh that one off and move on. But I have been in class where teachers will continually kind of self-criticize as they're teaching. Yeah. And it's a little bit heartbreaking and it's quite distracting mm. as well. Yeah. It really is. It is heartbreaking. And it shows, I guess it shows this vulnerability that we all have and maybe as well the importance of us practicing what we're preaching to around compassion. And I think, I feel like I've moved a long way forward in this in the past probably four or five years, but I used to be in, incredibly self-deprecating and, and really mainly internally, not in my teaching, but um, just generally as a person. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah, I just tear myself to shreds, I think, internally. And I was talking to another newer teacher recently who was saying that that's what she does. She critiques herself all the time. She feels like it's what she's doing isn't good enough. But her teaching is beautiful. And I was so surprised when she said that. So I think that we can be our own worst enemy sometimes. And an unfortunate side effect of that is maybe that it reminds other people that they have that tendency too. And if you fall into that trap in teaching, you can bring people into the same space pretty quickly. Mm, it <laughs> goes from a space of self-love to a space of self-criticism. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think the same maybe for people sharing the tough times they're going through as teachers. I think that can be a really challenging thing for students to hear at the beginning or end of a class that um, your teacher is having a personally tough time because there's a lot of empaths that come to yoga, a lot of carers, people in caring roles in their own lives, and um, it can trigger for them to their own mm. feelings around that. It was interesting, actually, like when Ran's mm. illness was going on, mm. all my private students, mm. I told. Yeah. Also, yeah. just for a practical thing, if I wanted to, like, if I needed to cancel a class right away, I just wanted to know what was going on in my life. But, like, I didn't tell any of my gym classes, mm. those ones. I just rocked up, did my thing. And it is actually quite helpful for me just to step into being a teacher and move and breathe and take everyone through. And Often, even if I was feeling a little bit wobbly before class, like I felt a lot calmer within myself yeah. afterwards. So yeah. sometimes we get a lot of, we're encouraged to be authentic as teachers, which is absolutely important, but we don't have to share everything no. all the time. No. Yeah. <laughs> and I think just as much as we're trying to create a safer space for students, we want to be able to create that for ourselves too, because as soon as you share something that you maybe don't feel safe sharing, then you've opened yourself up to vulnerability and people then know you in a different way that you may not feel comfortable with in a week when you realize that you've sort of bounced back. Something that's not talked about often is safer spaces for teachers, what feels safe in a teaching context and what do we feel safe communicating and knowing that you don't have to divulge all your secrets or your journey towards being a yogi when you're teaching. Like it's, it's not about that. Or yeah. your slip ups either. Yeah, like, <laughs> fail you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Like we all have them. I think we can safely assume everyone's had failure. Yeah. Everyone's made a yeah. mistake at some We've stage. All done it. Yeah, yeah. And we'll continue to. <laughs> so I know that you've done a lot of teaching of school children or mm -hmm. young adults mm -hmm. and a lot of work in the community sector. Has yoga always been a part of this or did they start off as being quite separate aspects of your life? They started off being separate, but I think that I found it really difficult to keep them separate because mindfulness has always been a part of how I've liked teaching. So even when I was teaching and I mainly taught outside of mainstream education, so I was in alternative ed, mainly I was teaching from a mindfulness perspective and really influenced by teachers like Bell Hooks and Paolo Freire who talk about teaching in a way that is critical, but also mindful and supportive of 
everyone to access the information. So I think also the yoga wasn't there in a physical sense very much so it was in a spiritual sense and ideological sense because so much of those critical theories, I feel like they relate to spiritual practice too. So for people who don't know, what's Mm. a critical theory? Critical theories, I guess, in a teaching perspective anyway, are those that acknowledge that not everyone walks into the room with equal cultural capital or equal social capital. So we don't all come in with the same stuff and networks and knowledge. And in a lot of the context that I was teaching in terms of high school, I was working with young people who'd been out of the school system since, you know, grade six or who had had significant family disruptions to their education, young parents, young mums, young dads, kids who were drug affected and were battling with that on their own. So a whole range of issues that had interrupted learning. So if we just put them in a regular classroom situation, there's no way that most of those kids can access the information. And so starting to tease it apart and think about how can we create a curriculum that's really inclusive and mindful and engaging and equal. So that's the kind of yogic influence, I would say, on that, because that's sort of what we're trying to do in yoga studios, Absolutely, too, yeah. is make sure it's accessible for everyone. And you have to tease apart the structure sometimes to get to that. So, But then I did end up teaching physical yoga, mainly because my, I think my students love to call me a hippie and just really <laughs> wanted to do it as a way of sort of poking fun. Uh-huh. But I think secretly they loved it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe to check with them about that. But, um, yeah, so we started integrating some yoga for fun. And then I've gone on to do that more and more over the years. Could you tell us about State of Being? So I guess that naturally evolved into State of Being, which is a bit of an umbrella organization now for a range of different programs. My real interest still within that is youth-focused programs. I just love working with young people. But there's also a whole range of other groups and cohorts that are underserved in our community around yoga and mindfulness, and particularly trauma-informed yoga and mindfulness. So we're working with other teachers who've done similar training to the training I've done and starting to support them to grow programs in their communities. And they all look a little different. So one other one that I run has been with the ASRC and supported by Westside, which has been great. So Mark Feely over at Westside has sponsored us pro bono to use the space and we bring people in from ASRC and we do a yoga class there. And that's the Asylum Seeker Research uh, yeah. Resource Centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we do it with um, staff and clients. But then another really different program is one with CoHealth where we work with a group of clients there and that's a term-based program and we hire a space and we pay for that space. And yeah, so they all have slightly different models just depending on community need. And I'm really interested in growing that around teacher interest too, because there are so many great teachers in Melbourne who are interested in getting out of the mainstream studio space and starting to work in different ways. So I think as well, like it's great because I've had this experience myself when I've wanted to offer a community-based class Mm. and like just no one's come. Mm. So to have a bigger umbrella organization who can kind of support you with the aspects of the class that's not the actual teaching. Definitely. Yeah. It's really helpful. Yeah, I think so too. And I feel like some of the really strong principles that I have, I have a really strong principled practice around trauma informed and that's my experience, but then there are other teachers who have body positive practices and there are other teachers who really focus on queer friendly practices. And I think all three of those things have to be part of the mix with state of being. Absolutely. And then also thinking about differently abled bodies and how we can involve that in the mix too. And then aging bodies as well. So we have these experts in our community who are working in different spaces. And I think starting to come together as a community of practice almost and learning from each other and saying, okay, how can my language be not only trauma informed, but body positive and queer friendly and able bodied informed and sort of supportive of a whole range of different experience, like an intersectional yoga practice. (laughs) So self-care is something that you really focus on in your teaching. It's a beautiful aspect of your teaching. And we often kind of see the commercial aspect of this concept, like treat yourself, (laughs) get that expensive moisturizer. (laughs) Can you tell us about some of the other aspects of self-care, which is obviously such an important part of community teaching? Yeah, beyond the expensive moisturizer. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's such a, it's a trap, isn't it? The idea that we have to spend money to get self-care. I think that locks a lot of people out of the practice. And I've been really interested recently in starting to document some free self-care tips because a lot of people I work with, they're interested in the language of self-care, but they don't have the resources to go get a massage or to do that sort of big, big buck stuff. But for me, I like to think about self-care as having these three different sort of modalities. And the first is something that Tara Brock refers to as mindful contact. And it's a daily practice of taking a moment each day just to come into contact with yourself So very much based in Buddhist mindfulness, but 
um, also in self-care. So the traditional way to do that might be to take one hand to your chest and close your eyes, take a couple of breaths and just check in and see what's moving around in there. So that's a daily sort of practice that I think anyone can do. Mm. Especially because it's not a half hour expectation that you need to find time for that half hour sitting practice. Definitely. And I think the hand touching on body, that tactile aspect of it can become almost like a mnemonic tool. So every time you bring your hand to your chest, it can be a deep breath or it can remind you to refocus. The second one is self-care maintenance which is the things that we do weekly or around a day that promote our self-care. Some of those might be organizational or really mundane things that just enable you to feel like life is okay. And I think those are important things that we have to do. And then the other one is emergency self-care, which is when the shit really hits the fan and you just have to know what to do in those moments. And with those ones, with the emergency self-care, I find it best to have a written down version of that. Because I know for me, with my journey around anxiety, despite it softening a lot over the years, if I do get into a sort of panic state or anxious state I don't remember what I'm meant to do there is no way I'll remember in that state so having it written down is really useful and I know for me part of that process is who can I talk to and I have a list of people that I can call if I'm feeling that way and so community can become a part of self-care as well beautiful so when you write things down do you kind of have that up on a wall in your house or like Mm. in a book or I do now I have a little um, and I do this sometimes at self-care workshops I just have a kind of business card shaped piece of paper or cardboard that just goes in my wallet and I can pull it out at any time just in small writing a couple of things that I need to do Um, but other people write it up and have it on walls and yeah and their phones just whatever works and I think another major part of self-care for me has been recognizing that over the years Uh, My self-care practice actually enabled me to continue living an unhealthy lifestyle. And so I would have all these things that I would do that, you know, I would buy fresh veggies and buy organic produce and make healthy meals and go to yoga and do all these things that felt like self-care. But I was working 11 hour days in an office and I was incredibly burnt out and I was suffering from things like adrenal fatigue, but I was still doing the healthy stuff. So I was sort of creating a situation where I could continue to be unhealthy by practicing self-care. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that I think is important to recognize too. I think as well, sometimes this is about teaching languaging But say in a yoga practice, often we're like taught about, you know, staying in a challenging position and breathing through it and being okay with discomfort. Mm. And sometimes that translates into life of just like, okay, I can breathe through this. I can go to yoga after this and kind of not realizing, oh, my whole life is discomfort at the moment. I need to make some big changes, not just these smaller self-nurturing things that are keeping me on this track. Exactly. exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And that same, that comes back to that same point we were talking about earlier about not making assumptions in a class situation anyway, that language will feel the same for everyone. Mm. So I know for someone like me, who's extreme A type personality, a few years ago, if you told me to stay with a shape for as long as possible, I would have stayed with it for as long as possible because I was very good at challenging myself and had a comfort in challenging myself. And there are other people, though, who that's not their comfort zone and it will benefit them to challenge themselves. So it's we're all so different and unique in that. And years ago, when I was living in quite a difficult situation, my mum said to me, you know, there's great strength in knowing when to walk away. And I'd never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. It felt super challenging to think walking away from something or changing something is strength. Yeah. But when you're wired to be like, I can make this work yeah. and put in more energy. Yeah, exactly. Just keep pushing harder. Yeah. 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 I have heard as well as an instruction in class, the moment when you want to come out of a pose is when the yoga starts, mm. which is kind of like, mm, yeah, that, that could be problematic for people. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Like is pain yoga? Yeah. Mm. And what, how do you know when someone's pain starts and stops? How do you know you're not hurting yourself physically Mm. and mentally? Yeah, and what has that person's experience of pain been previously? Because some people are numb to pain. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. So I'm not feeling pain yet. Hasn't. Yeah, Yeah, I'm not doing yoga yet. I'm not getting yoga. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's quite scary. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've got a lot going on currently in terms of studying, (laughs) teaching, (laughs) consulting, and running a Mm not-for-profit. What self-care strategies, and you've you've given us a few, which are really great, Mm -hmm. are you currently using? And I guess since you've given us the small day-to-day ones, what are those larger ones that just give you that big picture view of like, 
okay, maybe this schedule is okay this week if I do all of my self-care, but it's not sustainable in the future. And I know a lot of teachers who have a lot of different interests and put their heart into everything do get caught in this trap of just wearing themselves out oh it's the irony of yoga Mm -hmm. teaching isn't it we just burn ourselves out my biggest practice at the moment which will sound tiny i'm sure to to others is learning to say no no that's huge it's yeah some people are good at it right like they just naturally can do it i'm terrible i can't and i spend a lot of my time undoing things i've said yes to recently i've started trying to find the strengths to say i'll have to get back to you is my intermediate response to be shortly followed up with a no i don't have capacity at the moment (laughs) But I think there's a great strength as well in saying no and recognizing your own limitations because equally with being heart focused people and empathetic people, there's nothing worse than feeling like you haven't done your best because you're tired and burnt out <laughs> so yeah I think mm, that's a big knowing thing. you have a double to teach that evening and you don't want to get off your couch yes oh the fatigue you've recently moved from mm. living in a big city to mm. living on the beautiful surf coast mm. And while that sounds like a lot of people's dream, I imagine that there would be some challenges in Mm. that as well. How's it kind of changed your work week and Mm. how you think about teaching now? Yeah, it's been a big shift and I feel very lucky that there's a great yoga community down here because yoga is wonderful and there are other studios that are wonderful too and um, it's nice to have that support and be able to teach close to home I also work from home in my consultancy work so that makes it easier mm. but definitely the shift in terms of driving and having space and time to do the things I used to do has, has been a bit drastic and recognizing I mean a lot of people spend time in their cars and I had never really been one of those people so it's given me a new insight into teaching around how sedentary lifestyles can be and the impact of driving and then sitting at a desk yeah so it's been that's been really illuminating for me too is to think about different ways of moving bodies in response to that it's interesting as well like because I only learned to drive a couple of years ago and when you're on the road with other people you're so you're interacting with a whole lot of other different people's energy Mm. and sometimes just everyone is cranky yeah and it's hard to Go take to yoga class yeah. after that. Yeah. And you may be running late. And, you know. <laughs> and I, yeah, that's where mindfulness practices for me, they just really come into play. I feel like the easiest place to be mindful is the yoga studio with the incense and the calming teacher voice and the music. But it's so much harder when you're in traffic and people keep cutting you off or mm. you're running late. And, and that's when you've got to be mindful because someone might get killed if you're yeah, not. exactly. Mm. It is. It's where it becomes real, isn't mm. it? Like all this stuff we teach has a real place. So in some ways it's been good, I guess, getting out of just yoga teaching because I'm remembering what it's like to have other jobs and other parts of life. So body image and eating disorders and lack of representation, they're really massive issues in society today. And the image that we often see representing yoga is this beautiful, thin, flexible, affluent white woman, maybe on a beach doing a handstand in a bikini. And obviously not all yogis look like this. And I think that many teachers and yoga companies trying to sell us things are more switched on to trying to represent more inclusivity and diversity in their messaging and in their social media. But the other side of that, like tokenism is real and inclusivity is not just a multi-racial advertising (laughs) campaign. Um, Would you like to speak a little bit about this and about your approach to like images that you share and your social media and just maybe some tips for teachers who don't want to be part of the problem Mm. yeah and I think in this space it's it's really not my space because it just it can't be because I am a lot of those things that you mentioned in terms of representation that's actually my question like if this is what I look like Mm. I don't want to be part of the problem just sharing pictures of me doing handstands And I, I learn so much from other teachers in this. And I think social media is really positive in this respect for me, actually, to learn from people like Sarah Harry in the local context and also to learn from people like Dan Bundy in the international context about representation of different bodies and representation of different people who are practicing yoga. And I think the way that people represent themselves needs to be different depending on who they are and applying that kind of intersectional insight into our yoga practice 
I'm really conscious that there are so many yoga teachers that look like me and just by virtue of my skin color and my, and my shape and being um, a white Western woman, I could very easily just meld, mix into that and promote the same things. But I really choose to do something different in that respect because I think that I want to open up the space for different bodies to be in that. And I don't want to crowd people's feeds with more of the same and sort of perpetuate that same social construct around yoga and beauty when there are so many different forms of beautiful and they're not seen enough. Um, so yeah, so I choose to wear looser clothing when I'm teaching and in my social media, and that's a personal choice. I also find that the feedback that I've received is that people don't look at your body as much as a teacher when you're wearing looser clothing. So they're not looking so much at form and shape and they can find it themselves in social media too. I think that maybe that it serves the same purpose, but I also think that some people, they want to celebrate their bodies and wear a bikini on the beach and do it. Like, yeah, go for like, it. Because you do want to share like that sense of feeling good in your body. Yeah. Like, and yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think the answer is to hide our bodies I don't think that's it, but I think it's maybe to be conscious of whose bodies do we see more, who isn't being seen, and is there a way of shifting that? Because whilst my body type may be the most visible in terms of yoga, it is definitely not representative of society more generally. In fact, I'm a minority. So we're seeing a minority become the majority and we need to flip that so that we see real bodies and a real diversity. And also so that we're not turning people off trying yoga if they don't look absolutely. like that. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And yeah, and I, there's just no correlation between the way you look and the way you practice. So it's it's kind of a falsity that's being produced by social media. Mm -hmm. And I steer clear of the big companies like Lululemon who think that they can predict people's ability by not only creating certain dress sizes in their yoga. So yeah, solidarity and ally, I think is a key term there. I guess I struggle with this as well because, you know, I do pose the occasional picture of myself doing an arm balance yeah, and, yeah. and I sort of feel like, well, I sort of went through this whole struggle with my health and I overcame it and it's saying, well, you can do this after something like that has happened. So yeah, like I appreciate my ability to be able to do this again. Mm, mm. Definitely. So yeah, I'm the, I'm not sure what the answer is about this either. <laughs> I think there's got to be space for you to do that. That's why it's mm -hmm. so important that everyone has space and authenticity is maybe the key part and being really conscious about what we're presenting and run your narrative. It's so strong what why you do what you do. And I think that that's, you know, it's an empowering message and people, people feel empowered by that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I do. And I think even with Garden of Yoga and the whole, yeah, it's, you're promoting something different and there's there's not many people doing that so it's important to do that in a positive way like oh, you do thanks this is my little fan out moment yeah. <laughs> and I mean like realistically our Instagram's 80% of our cat anyway yeah same, same yeah <laughs> so the answer is just get a pet yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> We see a lot more studios becoming uh, inclusive and trauma sensitive and you know body positive and that's obviously a fantastic thing but do you think there could be a problem with it just becoming a box to tick and people not necessarily following through on, on these type of really positive actions? And if so, do you think there's a way to sort of overcome this or what, what do we do? Mm, I've been thinking about this actually because mm. I met with my dear friend who you know, Isabel Stoner, who's very interested particularly in what queer-friendly spaces look like. Mm -hmm. And she does a lot of personal work in her teaching around working with her students around gendered language and what they're comfortable with and how to teach in a way that's really inclusive. Um, and so we, we talk about this quite a lot too. How do you make that practice real and living? And I wonder whether there's the potential maybe to have ambassadors within studios mm -hmm. who kind of come together as a learning community and then go back into their studios and educate their teachers. Because I think there's always one teacher at least who'd be willing to champion that in a studio not everyone has capacity, but as empathetic people, everyone's willing to learn. So I think maybe having those champions, those ambassadors might be a positive way. And um, I don't know how that would start or what it would look like, but I feel like it could be a great community mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then it's also that ambassador, I imagine, would be teaching from their own lived experience. Mm. So they would be a great person to go to if you do have those questions about yeah. like, oh, I'm not sure about this thing that I said can I talk to you about it? Or I have, I have someone coming to the class. I'm not sure if I'm doing right by them. Mm. And 
I guess you can always talk to the person yes. in the class. Yes. Like, do you feel supported? Mm. Yeah. But that can be a little bit confrontational as well, especially if someone is coming in in a vulnerable place to be mm. singled out mm. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's great to just have, I guess, another layer of support within your community. Exciting. We'd sort of thrown around the idea, I don't know if we were going to do it, but once the studio's open, possibly having a sangha session. Like maybe once a month? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have, have teachers come together and talk about these type of issues and possibly record them if people were okay with that. Great. I do a podcast around it. I guess Great. that's that peer-to-peer community learning, mm. which is a little so bit different important. to going to a workshop or doing a training. Yeah, and knowing there's no silly question or because mm. yeah, that's oh, that's such a great idea. And not having a financial obligation as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think that's a great idea. And I think if one of the most challenging experiences as a yoga teacher is feeling like you're on an island mm. because we work these odd hours and we don't even get to see our peers that much, so having an opportunity to come together is be cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Thanks. Obviously. <laughs> I guess if we've finished all the questions, <laughs> this takes us to our picks of the week. And do you remember your pick of the yeah, week? Yeah, my pick of the week is the Guilty Feminist podcast with Deborah Francis White. She's always hosting it, and there's usually another co host. And it's very intersectional feminism. And like you can tell by the name, it's very much about not beating yourself up for not being this perfect feminist all the time in your life when the world is just set up in such a patriarchal way that we come up against all of these contradictions and our own insecurities and just unpacking all of that in a really real way. Like the start of the podcast is always, I'm a feminist, but this week this thing happened. (laughs) And she also has a lot of great female or gender non-conforming stand-up comedians on every week. So it's definitely on the educational and entertaining Mm -hmm. side of things which I very much enjoyed while scraping paint out from between bricks on the (laughs) side of my house (laughs) yesterday (laughs) so yeah that's a great one well my choice is and I hope I didn't use this last time but my choice is a movie called Coco which is a Pixar slash Disney film Mm -hmm. And it is about this young Mexican boy and it goes into the Day of the Dead and I think it's actually really interesting because it's a Disney kids slash family movie which the major theme is death but it's super colourful, super beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it was it was really super sad at the end and I, I just think everyone should watch it so yeah <laughs> so i've been reading the radiant sutras oh uh, good and, choice. <laughs> yeah. and that's one of the texts that i have been reading at the end of class sometimes in that mindfulness section and it's just a beautiful text really accessible language lovely meditative provoking little snippets of the sutras too yeah i love that book mm. um i actually uh, use some of it in one of my teacher training uh, we had to do a meditation and I, I live with that so yeah no it's a great book isn't it great for leading into meditation like mm. you could just read one tiny bit and it's so rich mm. that you could just sit with that mm. yeah mm. and it's such an ancient text mm. but it seems so of the present moment mm. don't they always yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for meeting with us today well actually we came and met yeah. with you yeah. but that, thanks for writing being a beautiful home yeah. 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 yeah thank you it's been amazing it's been lovely thank you so that was our conversation with joe buick i hope it's given you some insights into a trauma-informed approach and why it's so important Next episode is an interview with Kay Tribe. Kay is a myotherapist, yoga teacher, and the director of the Academy of Yoga and Mind Body Education in Melbourne. Kay is a very well respected teacher and widely acknowledged as an anatomy guru. So, amongst other things, we asked her a few anatomy questions that came from our audience. Now, before I leave you, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. Also, we would love to hear from you. You can comment on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or join our group on Facebook. The theme song in this podcast is Baby Robots by Goso and used with permission. Do yourself a favor and get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. See you soon. Big, big love.